This is concept three notes. We're going to be talking about energy flow through ecosystems. And these notes are the same for honors versus CP. So whoever you are, we're glad you're here. Now, you may have been overwhelmed by concept one and two. Those were a lot of nitty gritty details. We're going to look big picture now. What are we talking about? Where is this energy ultimately coming from? And then how is it going to eventually get to us as that ATP, as that cash money for ourselves, like we talked about. So for Earth, all energy on Earth is originally coming from the sun. So how do we get that energy? I can't just go out in the sun and lay out there and come back feeling energized for the day. I love laying out in the sun, but that's not how I get energy. So how does this happen? There are two overall ways to access energy. You can be a producer, or consumer. Producers are also known as autotrophs. Let's break down this word. Auto means self, troph means nourish. They are self-nourishers. They get their energy from non-living sources, like the sun. Almost all of them capture their energy in the form of, the sun, of sunlight, that's their non-living source, during a process called photosynthesis, and they make simple sugars from it, which we'll learn about in concept four. Examples of producers, plants, some bacteria, algae. These are all producers. Now, you could also be a consumer. These are known as heterotrophs. Hetero means other, troph means nourish. These are other nourishers. They get their energy from living or once living organisms. So when you eat a hamburger, that's a once living organism that was a cow. Examples are animals, most bacteria, fungi. These are some examples of consumers. Let's zoom in on producers first. So how are they getting their energy? There's two processes they use. They can either be photosynthesizers or chemosynthesizers. Both of these processes are using non-living sources for energy. In photosynthesis, that source is the sun, like we said. Plants, cyanobacteria, these are some of the organisms that are doing this. That equation is they're using carbon dioxide and water to make store that sunlight energy and glucose and oxygen, and then also making oxygen. Now, chemosynthesis, the source of energy for chemosynthesis is chemicals like sulfur and methane. Now, this is a much more rare process. The majority of our producers are doing photosynthesis, but an example of chemosynthesizers are deep sea vent bacteria that live down there. And um, an example of how they can do chemosynthesis with sulfur is here they're using carbon dioxide and they're doing this reaction and it's going to make um, some glucose too but it's just a totally different situation we're not going to get into any more detail about this but we're going to spend a whole concept on photosynthesis so just know ultimate source of energy for all life on earth is the sun plants and other um, producers are going to mainly be doing photosynthesis to capture that energy from the sun stored in glucose that are then, then consumers like us can access. So we get our energy from eating other organisms. Then we break down the macromolecules inside what we ate and we convert the energy from there into a usable form in a called ATP in a process called cellular respiration, which we'll be spending all of concept five on. There are four types of consumers and hopefully you remember these from elementary school science. We've got herbivores that eat only vegetation, carnivores that eat only meat, Omnivores that eat both, and then detritivores, also known as decomposers. They're going to eat dead materials or detritus, um, is a way some form um, some people refer to them as. We're going to watch this in action in class. I'm not going to play it now, but this is an amazing example of um, energy flow in action. You can see the sun, the ultimate source. You're going to see some producers. You'll see some consumers, and um, I want you to specifically look for the different types of consumers. Make note of if you see an herbivore or a decomposer or um, omnivore, that kind of thing, and we'll talk about it. But for the sake of the video, we're going to keep pressing on. So something else you may be familiar with from elementary or middle school science um, would be a food chain. So this just is almost like a picture or a map of where the energy is flowing, okay? And it only goes one direction. It's showing where the energy is going. So from grass to the grasshopper. Grass doesn't eat grasshoppers. Grasshoppers eat grass. So it's showing the direction with which the energy is going. They're tracing a single flow of energy. They also so, so show something that may be new. This is called trophic levels. These are the levels of nourishment 
in a food chain. All right, so we're going to talk about those trophic levels in a second. But first, I have to mention the rule of 10. As energy is flowing from one organism to another, from grass to the grasshopper, to the mouse that eats the grasshopper, to the owl that eats the mouse, a lot of the energy is being used for metabolism, for that organism's own energy purposes. But a lot of it's getting converted to heat, too, because it's not a perfectly efficient process. Because of this, the next organism on the chain, it's only getting 10% of the energy it obtained in the previous level. And this is called the rule of 10. The other 90% is being used by the organism or it's lost, which I put in quotations because it's not truly lost because um, energy is never created or destroyed in a system. It only changes forms. It's just being um, lost, again, in quotations, in the form of heat. All right, so let's look at trophic levels on this food chain. Producers are always level one. They're the first level. So level one is your producers. Level two are your primary consumers. These are your first consumers. They're going to eat producers. Level three is going to be your secondary consumers. They're going to eat primary consumers. And they may eat some producers too, but in this food chain, they're going to, level three is a secondary consumer. This mouse is. Level four is a tertiary consumer. You can also have, if something eats the owl, that would be a level five, a quaternary consumer. So it can keep going. But this is what we're talking about with trophic levels. And again, remember the energy only flows one direction. It's flowing this way. All right, can we classify each type of consumer? So this grasshopper, if it's eating grass, that makes it an herbivore. This mouse, if it's eating grasshopper, that's a carnivore in this food chain. It may eat something else in another food chain. They can be on different levels. Think about you as a human. When you eat a salad, you're a primary consumer. You're eating a producer. When you eat a cow, you're a secondary consumer because you're eating a cow, or excuse me, you're eating a, you're a tertiary. Well, we'd have grass, cow, human. You're a secondary consumer. You're eating a primary consumer who's eating a producer. Now, Food web. This is going to show multiple food chains at once and how they interconnect. So remember, different things can eat different things. They don't only just eat one thing. So look at this mouse, for example. It has two arrows going into it, showing that it eats two different sources. It eats both grass and it eats these larvae right here. Okay, so it's inputting two different sources. It only gets eaten by the owl. Okay, so we can look at these maps to depict different food relationships and, and consumer relationships. We can also organize this flow of energy, not just in a food chain or web, but also in a trophic pyramid. So this is just a model that's gonna show how energy flows through an ecosystem. And typically it's gonna show one of three things. It can show the amount of energy that's available at each trophic level. Remember, the levels get smaller as you go up the pyramid. That's why we use the pyramid shape because of that rule of 10 and only 10% of the energy being passed on. Trophic pyramids can also show numbers. They can represent the amount of organisms that exist at each trophic level. And in order for an ecosystem to be stable, it should have a, a, the most broad level should be that base at the bottom of the pyramid. And then the highest level consumers should be the most limited amount at the top. You can also have a biomass pyramid. This can represent the total mass of the living organic matter that's at each trophic level. So we're really just um, quantifying it in different ways. This will be a lot simpler when I show you an example. Okay, so let's go back to our original food chain, our grass, grasshopper, mouse, owl food chain. Grass is the producer, so that would go on the first level. Grasshoppers eat them, mice eat them, owls eat them. So that's how we figured out these levels here. Now, if I want you to label the trophic level numbers, we always start at the bottom. Producers are always level one. That makes the grasshopper two, the mouse three, and the owl four. Now let's label their trophic level names. Level one, again, is always my producer. Level two is my first consumer or my primary consumer. Level three is that second consumer, the secondary one, and then level four is tertiary. If there was something above here, it would be quaternary. Now let's label the percent of energy available. Remember, grass is the original, it's the producer. It's getting that energy from the sun. 100% of its energy is available to it. When the grasshopper eats that grass, remember our rule of 10. It only has access to 10% of its energy. 
Now, when the mouse eats the grasshopper, it's only getting 10% of 10. That's 1% of the original energy that was available to the grass. And then the owl, it's going to get 10% of 1, which is 0.1%. So it's only accessing, when it's eating in this order, it's only getting 0.1% of that original energy. So it's going to have to eat a lot of things to get enough energy um, to survive. And that is an overview of the flow of energy on a big picture scale.